Hello, everybody. Welcome to yet another episode of On the Bench by Yamaha Guitars. I am Pat Compolitano, senior designer, Luthier. And joined with me today is uh, Joshua Ray Gooch, longtime Yamaha artist and I would say great friend of mine. Uh, how you doing, man? Dude, I'm doing very well. I, I appreciate you having me here. This is um, this is cool. This is something that I I, I I would always hope that you guys would do because you make some absolutely incredible guitars. I know from personal experience, and I know a lot of other Yamaha artists who are all super stoked about the stuff that you've made them in the custom shop. And we're always talking about it. So it's great to actually show the public like the kind of work that you put in with the artists and like what you achieve that makes us, you know, end up sounding the way we want to in our heads, you know? Thanks, man. Thank Yeah. I mean, actually, you know, um, for Josh, like I've made pretty much more guitars for Josh and Jeff Schroeder than like anyone else. So, um, and really in the early days, I made more guitars for Josh than anyone for sure. Uh, so it's been really cool. We've had like a really great relationship, like, you know, always like, chit chat and and over the years we've become friends we go hang out at Daichan in North Hollywood there and I yeah. I miss that man I that's the one thing like I miss us getting to go and hang over there get some really dope you know homemade Japanese food like there's nothing there's nothing better I, I think I think both of us have a connection to Japan due to the fact that you know I, I my first tour when I was like I think I got the tour when I was 18, but actually went to Japan when I was 19 years old. I, I have a, Japan holds a very, very close place in my, in my heart because it was really the first place that I was ever like accepted and really put out there as a musician. And the people could not have been, you know, like I said, more accepting and more kind. And I just love the culture and I'm a massive Japanese food fan. And I've been with Yamaha since I was 18 years old. So I know both you and I have that affinity. We both love the culture and we get to work closely with a lot of folks in Japan and have a great admiration for the design and attention to detail. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, Yamaha's just got this crazy long history. It, it is an essential part of Japan, I think. You know, it is one of those like quintessential Japanese companies. And there's like been so many cool designs over the years and pioneered so many different products, not only guitars, you know, pianos, you know, uh, all the, like the synths and stuff, DX7, you know, it just like goes, you know, it, it's insane. So there, there's just like so much stuff to be inspired by. And I think, you know, you going there, well, let, let's put this in perspective though. <laughs> you know, Josh is not just like, a talented guitar player you just like the most killingest at a very young age so when you showed up it's not like any 18 year old kid showed up it's like you went there and like melted everybody's faces and then you also played with koshi right so it's like yeah i i was man so i was so so about. fortunate so yeah. so basically what ended up happening was i so I moved to Alabama. I graduated high school a year early. I moved to Alabama to work with this producer, Johnny Sandland, who had produced the Allman Brothers Band and Aquarium Rescue Unit and Widespread Panic and Derek Trucks and all these awesome artists that I absolutely loved. A lot of stuff for Capricorn Records in the early 70s. And it's kind of a long story about how he and I ended up getting into contact. It's a very strange story. But I ended up moving to Alabama, graduated high school a year early. And unfortunately, Johnny ended up having a stroke not long after I got out there. So I got to make some records with him, but he ended up falling ill and he couldn't make records anymore, at least for the time being. Unfortunately, Johnny's passed at this point, but this was this was back in 2008, uh, maybe seven, eight. So I ended up after trying to get out of my lease out there, moved back to California completely like I just screwed my whole life up. Like I didn't go to college. I moved across the country from San Diego to like rural Alabama and was like, what did I just do with my life? Like I have I didn't know what to do. And my parents convinced me to join this guitar competition, this guitar center competition. Yeah. yeah and it was the king, the king of the blues. Yeah, and yeah. after like four months, I had done like, I don't know, four or five of the competitions lo like locally in California. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, there's five people left in the country and I'm one of them. It was insane. So I ended up doing the national final. I got second place. 
I was completely defeated. I was like so bummed. There's that that's a whole nother thing. But after the show, yeah. crazy, crazy, total bullshit. If you ask me, you know, it's like, well, they, look, I, I can't speak. I, I am very happy that people liked what I did, but the, I will say that I was told they eventually the next, the following years, they changed the criterion yes. for how to grade the competition and whatever the lowest. Cause basically what happened is I, I got tens on everybody's scorecard. One person gave me a one. They hated yeah. me. I don't, I still don't know. Whatever. Now they have, they had a thing after that where they have, they throw out the lowest score and they only yeah. add up whatever that that's a crazy thing. I, I was really defeated at the time just because I, I put a lot into it. And, and I really thought the audience reaction, I was like, dude, I think I might've taken this. So whatever. So I'm super defeated. I'm walking backstage and this guy who's a photographer, a very famous photographer, Robert Knight. Now, when yeah. you go outside a guitar center and you see those photos of like Jimmy Page, Jimi Hendrix, Eddie Van Halen, Eric Clapton, Carlos Santana, those are almost all, if not all, at least they used to be Robert's photos. Yeah. So yeah. Robert's the guitar center ph photographer. So he came up to me and he literally, this is like a scene from a movie. We're like in a dark hallway at uh, the, the now deceased House of Blues um, in Hollywood. And he literally walks up to me and hands me his card and goes, this isn't over for you. Call me tomorrow. And then oh walks, God. walks away into like a dark hallway. Like this <laughs> shit was planned. So it's crazy. So like plume of smoke, just, you know, yeah, yeah like, the, you know, a handkerchief and he vanishes behind it. <laughs> it felt that planned out. Like he really kind of nailed it. Like I would have bought it in a movie and been like, dude, this guy's a great actor. Yeah. Um, it was epic. So I just remember looking at the card being like, okay, well, I, I clear this producer I was working with in Alabama is, is sick. And, and I, you know, I wish him well, but he can't work this competition. Yeah. I just got second place in this is this, this, uh, business cards all I got. Yeah. So yeah. I called Robert the next day and he, I started driving up from San Diego and meeting with Robert a lot. And he, there was a movie made about Robert's life called rock prophecies that actually won a bunch of awards and actually beat out that it might get loud movie with Jimmy oh. page and like it beat it in a lot of competitions. And that, that's a great movie. So it says a lot. Um, Robert in that movie had interviewed bees, this Japanese band. Yeah. Yeah. And he had done some photos for them before. So he was in contact with them. They hit him up to be like, Hey, Koshi Inaba, the singer of bees, the biggest Japanese band in Japanese history. They've sold like a hundred million records in Japan alone. Yeah, um, I mean they're massive in Japan. It's just you know, it's insane. <laughs> like they'll they'll do like several dates in a row at Tokyo Dome, seventy five thousand people, and it'll sell out in like an afternoon. It's completely crazy. But Koshi's solo tours are still so big that he does like sold out arena dates all over Japan. So yeah. they hit up Robert about this, and he sent them like five guitar players, and they wrote back, "Who's Joshua? And yeah. how old is he?" And I was eighteen at the time. And they were like, nah, sorry. And Robert convinced them, much to his credit, to give me an audition. If, you, if he's too young, if you don't like him, fine. But at least give him a chance. Yeah. So I went and did this audition with uh, the uh, the other North American band members that had been hired. Some of them had been in B's previously. And they called me two weeks later and were like, you got the gig. You're going to do an entire like summer into fall tour, uh, arena tour of every single place Every basically every arena in Japan and multiple dates at Budokan. That's so, so yeah. It was completely crazy. So that's how I got linked up with Yamaha. And that was my first tour ever. And I hit up Yamaha because I was going on this tour and I literally had two or three guitars that were elect electric guitars. Like I didn't have enough for the tour because I was a kid. Like I had no money, I, yeah. you know. Well, you um, know, that's, that might be part of like their hesitation. They're like, oh, it's an 18 year old kid. We don't know, like, you know, is he just like going to party or, you know, and that's not who you are. Like you're no, I, very prepared every time. It's like, man, you've got all your licks down, you know, you, you come ready to rock, you know, and, and I think that goes, we'll talk a little bit more about what you've been working on lately, but it's like, you know, it's, it's come to, to show in, in the rest of your career. Man, I, I appreciate that. I, I came as prepared as I could be given those circumstances, but we literally ran um, we ran into Ken, um, who's worked at Yamaha for many, many, many years, like decades, right? Like literally yeah. several decades. Yeah. For yeah. Me so on, yeah. I, we ran into him at a Paquito Moss, Robert and I, and he literally oh, yeah. said, why don't you come by Yamaha and check out our guitars? 
And yeah. that was it. Like I, I didn't really know Yamaha outside of their acoustics. I did, uh, to be honest, like I, I knew I liked their acoustic, but that's all I knew. And I went to Yamaha and they, they had me play one of the former artist relations reps had me play their SG SBG series. Yeah. And I lost my mind. And yeah. we, we basically signed a deal that day. And I was like, I want to be with Yamaha. And that was in 2000 and probably, I think 2009, like yeah. early, early 2010. It's been a decade. Yeah. I mean, so you've been with Yamaha longer than I have, which is insane. Um, and I think maybe at that point, were they were we in uh, Burbank? Or was it still North Hollywood at that point? Dude, it was still North Hollywood. Still, yeah, um, it was. It was. This was like this was three uh, or at least, or two uh, artist relations spaces ago. Yeah, yeah. Oh, crazy yeah. man, Paquito Moss. I haven't been there in a minute either. Uh, I'm dude, getting I know. Hungry now. <laughs> I know, dude. That place. Oh, man, is, that place is so there. good. I got, I got so fat because I'd go to Paquito Moss like every day <laughs> for lunch with Daryl. Well, if you're going to gain weight, you might as well do it through Paquito Moss and yeah, not like Burger yeah. King, you know? Oh, my God. Awesome. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's so cool. And, I mean, you've been pretty much playing like Yamahas ever since. Of course, you have like other guitars that, you know, you had, you know, growing up or, you know, things that you've won, right? I think King of the Blues, like you, they gave you some guitars. And, yeah, and I mean, stuff. I've got other guitars. I've got some vintage stuff. But when, I, when I'm on stage with Shania, who I've been playing with now since 2012 – yeah. And and basically every big stage gig, whether it was like Koshi or when I went out with Beth Hart, like I basically went out with Beth Hart in in uh, place of Joe Bonamassa because they had just done a record together. And Joe has such a big touring situation and is so massive that um, he continued his own touring and Beth wanted to tour this record. So I ended up touring with Beth Hart, sort of playing all the solos or, or, or at least in the places of of where Joe played on the record. So any of those gigs, I play exclusively Yamaha. In the studio, I've got old vintage stuff and weird stuff that I do. But I, I, even in the studio, I play a lot of Yamaha stuff. I just made a couple records during quarantine, and I'd say it's 80 to 90% Yamaha, even on all the records. And then on stage, like I said with Shania, I've got, I don't know, 15 to, to 18 Yamahas out with me whenever I go on tour with her. Yeah, you have quite the arsenal, which is pretty rad. Uh, yeah. And with Shania, it's necessary. Like, I, it's seriously like I use every single. It's not just for like, look at how many guitars I have. It really is like I actually use all of the guitars because every single song has such specific tones on that yeah. that we've programmed them to literally fit exactly with certain guitars that I have. Yeah, and and we have the the request for you to pl show some guitars and shred a little bit. We'll we'll yeah. get there, uh, Scott. We'll we'll we'll. Um, bust out some guitars in a little bit um so yeah i mean when when you came to us you know you would hit us up and, and just say hey you know for this song i need this sound and it's in a special you know it's like in a certain tuning so like you know you had your i think you had the sg the black S, sbg um 1820 in like f right and then you know certain guitars like you'll keep in standard or down a half step or whatever it is it's it's all over the place. You're right. That that black SBG was in tune to F. And the reason for that was uh, that's for Man, I Feel Like a Woman. And yeah. that song, I play the solo on. So having a capo on the first fret, once I soloed, it was completely like a mess because you can't solo like bending blues solos with a capo and then come back and have it be like perfectly in tune. Yeah. So yeah. we ended up having to figure out a way we put on like eights which is not, I usually play like tens. We put on like eights, initially yeah. nines and moved down to eights and tuned up to F. We've got tunings. There's one tuning. I literally don't even know what it, I don't even know what to call it. I don't even know what the tuning is actually. Like there's some crazy stuff where I'm imitating a lap steel from the record. And I, we tuned it yeah. specifically for the part that I play. Like it's yeah. not for, it's not for improvising. Like I'm literally doing like a part from a record and the only way to achieve the sympathetic strings next to each other was this insane skin, uh, like skinny top, heavy bottom tuning that we figured out. But I've got tunings that are all, I've got half step down, whole step down, half step up, drop D. Ooh. You know, yeah. it's all over the place. Yeah. That's some wacky stuff. And it, it's cool because like, you know, I've worked on a lot of your guitars after you come off the road and stuff too. Cause like you'll, you'll hit me up and you'll be like, okay, this leg of the tour is done can you go over all my guitars and put them back to normal? 
Because they're they, jacked. They're totally yeah. like, especially when I'm in Vegas doing this sh- the stuff with Shania in Vegas, the climate there is so weird. By the time I get yeah. back to LA, th- there's no time for my tech because basically they pack up the guitars after the last show and just send them back. He, he And he goes yeah. back the next day, so he can't adjust my guitar. So by the time they get back to LA, they're a mess. And like, I, I like these, gu- I love the Yamahas that I play so much. I want to use them for recording stuff and just casual playing around the house. So like when I get back to LA and they they're unplayable, that's when I hit you up to be like, Hey man, can you make it so I can like actually track with these again? Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, you've been tracking quite a bit lately, huh? Dude, I, I'm very lucky. Like the, the start, the first few months of quarantine, I think like everybody was basically like uh, the lost section of the year that nothing happened, yeah. but um, a couple months ago, I made an entire record with uh, uh, the the bass player for Shania Twain and also Gwen Stefani, and he plays with a bunch of people. He he subs for Shakira. He's just an amazing bass player. Uh, Derek Frank recorded a solo record with um, Jim Scott, the producer Jim Scott, who produced like Rage Against the Machine, Tom Petty, Derek uh, or Tedeschi Trucks Band. Yeah. Like the Rolling Stones, Santana. He's done a lot of like my favorite records and engineered and mixed and does a whole bunch of stuff. So I went and made a full record with him. And then I've been doing quite a bit of TV and film stuff. Like it was just an, it just actually announced an hour before this. The uh, title track of the new Bill and Ted Face the Music movie yeah. was produced, uh, arranged and performed by myself and Corey Chirko, the the uh, other guitar player, the the band leader and other guitar player in Shania Twain's band. Yeah, that's so awesome. So you told me about this, you know, a few months back that you guys were like, you were gunning for the gig and then it ended up coming through. And you got, so like, that's so, so awesome. We were working on it for almost, almost nine months. Wow. It was a very long, like, I, I had done stuff for TV and film before, but never this extended a process. So we were working on it for a long time, but it was really fun. And, and all the guitars you hear on there from me are all the Yamaha. Those are all Yamahas in the movie. That's awesome. So, yeah. uh, but so you, the title track is to you guys, and it's it the also like the the play out at the end. Um, I can't talk about any of that stuff yet because the movie's not released yet. But yeah, uh, there's yeah. there's there's a lot of guitar stuff in the movie that that is pro- produced and performed by Corey and I. And then we also hired our friend Derek Frank, who I'd recorded that his solo record for, and also Shane Gallus, who's the drummer who had been in Bees uh, with Koshi for like the last twenty years. He also played with Ingve Malmsteen. He's played with he's he's incredible. Shane's amazing. Um, but yeah, they're the rhythm section that that we track for the movie as well. That's so cool, and it comes out Friday, right? Comes out tomorrow. Yeah, it comes out tomorrow. Oh yeah, tomorrow's, tomorrow's Friday. Friday. Yeah, we're we're doing like a viewing party because we we haven't seen the movie. It's the it's the hundredth day of March, I think, right? So I don't know Jesus. what day it is. What's what's up? What's it's like down? Four thousandth day of twenty twenty. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, <laughs> it's been yeah. brutal. It's brutal. But, yeah. Um. So I mean, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. You know, um, you guys were scheduled right to be in Vegas. Yeah, I mean, we were literally sent home, dude. Like we we were out for our second run with Shania at um, Zappos theater at planet Hollywood. Um, And we literally went, it was right at the beginning of March, like a week into March. And I was like, we're going to get sent home this because I could see the writing on the wall. I'd been reading a lot of stuff over in China and my parents, I'm from Seattle and Seattle was the first place in the States to get hit. So I was hearing reports from Seattle about what was going on. And I was like, we're going to get sent home. I don't want to be like pessimistic, but. And then after two shows, they were just like, guys, everything's shutting down. You got to go home. And so now um, I don't even know when the next actual like date is booked. I think December is still up on the web, but who knows? Who knows what's nobody knows what's going on. So, I mean, yeah. we're basically we were supposed to be out with Shania in Vegas on and off throughout the entirety of 2020. Yeah. And uh, so now that's all canceled. So. Well, um, somebody's I'm, gonna figure it out. It's gonna be Vegas, you know. Exactly. Yeah, their entire economy runs on those shows. So, yeah, I, I I hope that we're playing either by late the end of the year or early next year. But like I said, I you have you have no idea. Nobody knows anything right now. So, so maybe uh, you know, 
the nice part about Vegas is the stage will be pretty big, right? So you guys can keep your distance. And, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They could even set you up on your own horses, right? Because doesn't Shania come in on a horse? She she used to when we when we when I started with her in 2012, she would come out on a horse and like they had horses backstage, and like yes. they would it smelled Insane. it smelled like giant horse dookies, like because they were literally like there was there was they were backstage like right yeah, next you the like horse like chill out like you'll get to use the John in a minute you know they're like no. Well, it, here's something very <laughs> funny. So you can't force a horse to 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 do a number two, right? Um, you can try to coax it out of them, but you can't force them to. So it became known in Vegas when we were first out there that, dude, if you go to the Shania show, the horse takes a dump on the stage. <laughs> and it was so much of a thing that we went to, uh, we were invited to Carrot Top's performance. So we went with Carrot Top. It was like, you know, Shania and her husband and the whole band. Yeah. And in the in Carrot Top show, he has a guy come out on stage during the Shania segment and is like wearing a fake horse outfit and then drops uh, like one of those like uh, like magic magic shop uh, plastic dookies on the ground. Because like so it was so much of a known fact that like that was part of a like another show in Vegas. Oh my God. Yeah. And it did happen relatively often and it did smell as bad as you'd think it would. It was terrible. Awesome. Uh, (laughs) I want to know, you know, who's the guy that came out with the dustpan, you know, it was Uh, the horse trainer struck the set, you know, dude, Uh, he wasn't afraid. He's been around horse, whatever for uh, many years. He, he was like a world-class dude that literally trains like world-class, like, like they they got a legit like a couple that would come out and literally like bring the horses and they they were they were amazing they took as great care like every off day from the show the horses were like running through the mountains of Vegas and like you know getting yeah. exercise you know oh yeah it's it's a big deal you know have the, the animal trainers and all that stuff like that's that's wild well it's, it's just wild a, yeah what kind of production that you're playing in right because just yeah. It, if your show is big enough that they're going to bring a live animal out on stage, <laughs> like well, you're that, getting your money's worth. That was when we were at Caesar's Palace at, at the Coliseum, which is an even bigger venue. Uh, I would actually say that Zappos Theater now is better for the show because it's a little bit more, feels like a club, yeah, which is more. just better audience interaction than the Coliseum. But there was something very grandiose about the Coliseum that was pretty rad. Um, yeah. But I have to say, I actually enjoy the shows at Zappos more because it feels like a club. Even yeah. though it's still a big room, it feels like I can really interact. It's a little bit darker, and I like I like that. And, and they encourage people to stand, whereas in at the Coliseum, it's a little bit more of a sitting situation. Yeah, that's a little weird. You know, I always thought it was kind of weird, like you know, when you go to a show in Vegas, like you're sitting the whole time, right? I, you know, I, like dude, I don't want to sit at a concert like basically. Unless I'm seeing like a jazz show, I don't want to sit. Like I want to stand and like rock out. You know what I mean? Like I can't like imagine going to like a Motorhead show and you're seated. Ugh. Yeah, no, I couldn't do that. I mean, even a jazz show, if you sit down, you might fall asleep. So it's like, well, you know, some of the some of the very old high rollers certainly did. Oh yeah, because sure. some some people would get like you know they they drop a hundred grand at at, the, at Caesars yeah. and they'd get comps right. They'd get comp tickets because. Hey, you spent a hundred thousand dollars, but they'd be these very rich old guys. Yeah. And they would legit like before the show, maybe like when the intro music's just on, we'd come out and they'd be like waking up from sleeping. It's like 7 45 PM. (laughs) Yeah. They're like, I had my old routine. I showed up to the show and I (laughs) decided I was going to check. Well, when you got that much money, it's like, it does not matter. Like, dude, they've, yeah, they don't don't care what other people think. You know, they've, it's just like they, they've got their like thing of like Metamucil and Ovaltine just like mixed in. They just like shake it up. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> oh, man, we're getting inside baseball here. This is great. I know, right. Metamucil talk. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the cool thing is like you have played literally like some of the biggest venues on Earth. Some of the coolest stuff. Like you said, the, the Budokan. Um, that was crazy. Played some crazy stadiums, especially yeah. in Canada, too. Right. Where Shania's from. Yeah, I mean, we played some, and then and we played, uh, we headlined Stagecoach like three years ago. That was like eighty five thousand people, 
And then I thought that like at that point, that was the biggest show I'd ever played. And then a couple of years ago in 2018, uh, Shania had never played a show in South America. I don't believe. Um, and we went and did a show in Brazil and it was outdoors and there was a hundred, they said it was somewhere between a hundred and five and 110,000 people. That's awesome. I it mean, was insane. Everything in Brazil is huge when it comes to concerts, like all the rock and Rio and, you know, it's just like, you ever seen and, you know, it that, hurt. that was actually the first concert I ever saw that involved Brazil was, was when I was in like middle school, just starting to play guitar in like eighth grade. I watched the Iron Maiden rock and Rio. I was like, dude, there's like a million people there. Oh, dude, it's awesome. It's so cool. <laughs> it felt like that. It really did. And the Brazilian fans, dude, they're they're as good as everybody says they are. They're just like, they know every word. They're rabid. They just, and they also, they don't get all the American artists that they love and British artists and, and sort of, I guess, whatever, whatever, the, those sort of uh, English speaking artists. And, um, so when you go down there, they go insane because they want you to come back. They want to show you, like, we love you. Come back. Yeah. Well, yeah, they're sitting on the opportunity to, like, see somebody that they're not going to get, a, you know, a lot of chances to see. And totally. that's – it's so cool. I mean, everybody says that. You know, uh, Billy Sheen would say that. Like, you know, go to South America. It's crazy. Um, you know, all the dudes from Exodus and stuff. So it's it's rad. Um, it's, it's awesome. I, I, I absolutely love it. I want to go back for real. I want to do like a whole Brazilian tour to be honest, but oh, we'll yeah. what, who knows when that's going to happen, but oh, I know, I know. Not. Well, you know, hopefully things, things, you know, improve a little bit. Everybody wear your mask. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we can have some fun. I mean, every, we all want to go see concerts and have a good time, but I think we all got to, you know, be, conscientious and and respect each other's you know um well boundaries first right keep your your distance but you know yeah out of respect whatever we got to do whatever we got to do to get back to having shows i mean look i i not only miss playing shows i miss going to shows i mean i'm very lucky that like a lot of my friends i would consider to be some of the best musicians in the world i'm like and i love going and seeing my friends play because they're such kick-ass musicians and i miss seeing them like I really do. Like I, yeah, I think about and, it all the time. You know, in, in LA, you'd be able to go and see people play all the time. Go to the Viper, go to the Whiskey, and you know your your thing that you would do the Boba Jam, oh, dude. Um, which I loved. That was awesome. I mean, um, tell people a little bit about that too. That was like a, a you know round robin of just killers. Dude, it was so fun. Like it was so fun. So Boba Jam is basically, I'm a huge fan of Boba, like bubble tea. Um, yeah. I love it. I've like, I've gotten, I pretty much gotten Boba in like 42 of the 50 States, like every province in Canada, most of Western Europe. Like I, I search it out and hunt it down. So yeah. what my favorite place, this place, Tea Pop, um, I know the owner and she's fantastic. And I mentioned to her one time, I was like, why don't you have live music? She's like, well, we're kind of in a neighborhood and a lot of people want to do it at night and it's just not in our budget. And I was like, what about this? What about you yeah. don't pay us jack shit and we do it during the morning. Yeah. And she was like, yeah, let's do it. So basically I just call friends of mine who are amazing musicians and we show up at 10 AM on Thursdays. We did this for like nine months uh, last year. Yeah. And the whole show is improvised. The whole, like nothing is planned. Uh, there, I, there's not even really chord progressions in your head. Like I might have a couple ideas, but it's completely improvised. We don't talk about it. We literally give a key and just start playing. And every week it's a different band, except I'm, I'm there each week. Cause I sort of facilitate and call everybody, but it's yeah. crazy. Like people would come out and be like, you know, it got to the point where it was like packed and this is a massive outdoor patio at 10 AM on a Thursday. Yeah, there was yeah. times where it was literally packed like out the doors. And um, it's crazy because like people don't realize, like people that just show up don't realize, they, they love the music. They don't realize like, oh, that bass player, John Button is in The Who. And yeah. that keyboard player plays with Ziggy Marley. And like, like oh, that bass player, that guy, oh, he's in Modest Mouse or what, you know what I mean? Like there's all these super heavy players that came out and played. And um I, I, people that I don't think people realize because it really is like literally a patio, like a nice outdoor patio yeah, at a cool. boba shop. It's a cool vibe, but you wouldn't expect to go to a boba shop 
at an, a backdoor patio and see like Larry Goldings play keyboards. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like Larry plays in like John Mayer and James Taylor's band. And it's like, and I, I consider Larry to be one of the best keyboard players living right now. And like, he came out and, 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 and sat in with us new on like numerous occasions. Like, it's just crazy. It's, it's really a blast. And I miss the hell out of it. Cause you don't have to prep for it. There's nothing to stress about. If you feel yeah. comfortable yeah. with your improvisation, you're good. I wonder if it's like one of those things that, you know, you could restart because it's outdoors and, you know, it's like a little safer. We got to, you know, look into that. I'd, l- I'd love to help you get back on that train. But Man, I mean, that's a good idea. I think right now I'm playing it safe with T-Pop because I don't want them to get shit for having live shows and stuff. But um, I agree. I, I think that um, I-, I would like to do that. And I do think that you're right, like because it's outdoors and it's not that big of a place. Like it's a big, it's big for a patio, but it's not big for a venue. Yeah. So yeah. if we get, you know, 30 to 40 people out there, they could remain distant, keep masks on. The musicians can keep them on. So I, I hope in the next, I hope by the end of the year, I can get Boba Jam back up and running. Yeah. That's man. my goal. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. I, I want to help you get there too. Uh, well, yeah. We got some comments in the, in the comment section. Uh, everybody, if, if you're listening in the section, <laughs> Uh, let us know. Um, and Erin has been helping us in the background. She popped this one up. Josh, I've seen you demo uh, Yamaha acoustics. What are your three favorite acoustics and tone wood combos? Oh, this is like, um, you know, like a like a question that you'd get for a book report. Uh, right. I, very, you know, I, very detailed. Show your work. Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. You know, I have to say, I don't I don't really base what I like on tone woods and stuff like that i have to play it um because there's so many variables i mean pat can tell you more about this but the bracing and the size of the body and i mean the tone woods obviously play um you know they play a factor in it you know like obviously if you have a telly with a maple neck versus you know rosewood that the maple is going to be brighter but in general it has so many other variables that i i don't really i don't really think about it in that sense like uh I would have to sit down and play them and just see how they speak to me. I know that's maybe not the most, uh, uh, the no, answer you wanted, but I think, you know, you know, I, I think when it comes to like, um, like a person just going to your local guitar store and wants to know, like, I want a good guitar, what should I get? And then, you know, you do a lot of reading on the internet and, and you look up, you know, you, you kind of get an outline of, you know, somebody might say this wood sounds like this, or this wood sounds like this, but really when you show up, you, pick them up, you play them and you listen, you just, you know, this is what I like. It doesn't really matter what it, you know, looks like, or it's made out of. It's just, I like the sound of this. This kind of speaks to me in a certain way. So I guess, you know, like what's the acoustic guitar that you've been playing the most or, or have played the most? Um, I would say probably the FG, this guitar right here. Yeah. I was very lucky to get um, one of these, uh, the Japanese custom shop version of, the reissue, right? This is the reissue of the, the FG that like Elliot Smith and those cats used to play. And it literally says like the FG yeah. in the actual sound hole. But this guitar, yeah. this guitar sounds fantastic. And it's, it's, I just, I, whenever I, oh, it's not in tune at all. Um, <laughs> but um, it, this guitar is great. It records particularly well. Um, I, I bring it to the studio often. And uh, I get a get a lot of love out of that one. So that, that I'd yeah, say yeah. that's probably my favorite acoustic. But for a specific type of thing, like if I wanted a different, like uh, that guitar probably wouldn't be my first choice for like flat picking, like mm-hmm. for like bluegrass flat picking. Like so, it, it really depends. And and working as like a sort of session guitar player, whatever you want to call it, it's so dependent on what the day and the music that you're recording requires that that having a favorite is just really tough for me because it's so dependent on like if I was in a band and we had like a very specific sound that that's all I did it'd be be a little bit easier to be like this is what I do and this is sort of it but it's hard to do that as like a session and touring guy because it's it's all dependent you know yeah it all depends on you know that you didn't write the music that you're playing with Shania right so it's just like yeah. you're following what the record sounded like. So they're very specific. And I remember you even telling me once, like you were playing a solo and you used like the neck pickup, like you flipped it to the neck pickup. And then like after the show, like didn't like the sound engineer be like, Hey, what happened? Dude? No, this is even gnarlier than that. So, um, 
we had a pickup die in in one of our guitars. I can't remember what it was. I think that was actually the one time I wasn't playing a Yamaha because she specifically they actually had the guitar that they oh, used in the record. Uh -huh. Like it belonged to Mutt Lang. Like it was Mutt uh -huh. Lang's guitar. So it was like I don't know, some fender with like lace sensor pickups. Not really my favorite thing, but it it's what was on the record for this specific song. And since sure. we had the guitar, I was like, they, they basically asked me to play it. So I was like, okay, that's fine. Because um, ultimately, if, if she asks me to play guitar, that's what I've got to play. But sure. um, the pickup died. And we put in another pickup that was like another lace sensor pickup. It was like the same thing. In the same position, basically, I think it was the same pickup. We go out to sound check. And keep in mind, this, this the front of house guy had worked with Mutt Lang for like 35 years. Like he had worked on like Iron Maiden stuff, uh, uh, ACDC, Def Leppard, the Shania records, all Amazing. of them. Brian Adams. Here's so we, play, we play, I'm in the middle of the song and it comes to this break where I play this little arpeggio and he stops the whole sound check. <laughs> like she was there. Like it wasn't like we were warming up, like, like Shania yeah. was there. He stops the whole sound check and literally through basically like the mic throughout to all of our ears is like, what's different? What, what changed? And I was like, <laughs> dude, there's literally like 15 people on stage playing. And he was so specific and knew the exact frequencies with which it was supposed to sound like yeah. that he knew that we had swapped even the same pickup. It was a different pickup and he noticed. Yeah. And we, instead we had to literally fix the pickup instead of putting a new one in. That's how specific they get on that gig. Jeez, that's yeah. crazy, man. Yeah. And, Nigel, and, Nigel has some great ears. And your whole rig, too, is like set up in a certain way where you, you're you not foot switching anything, right? They're like, yeah. it's all everything's tempers. So, what happened is Corey Cherko, our band leader, and one of my best buddies and somebody I work with all the time, he actually went and, and, uh, did like impulse responses and everything into his Kemper of all the original amps from the record if he had them. So he uh -huh. has like he has some of the matchless amps that were used on the records because oh, Corey cool. Cherko Corey Cherko was also an engineer with Mutt Lang. Like he worked on the records, not just in the touring band. And so did his brother Kevin Cherko, who's now like a well known producer. He produced the last few Ozzy Osbourne records, Five That's Finger right. Death Punch, um, sort of a lot of like modern metal. And uh, Corey and Kevin Cherko worked with Mutt Lang, so they knew like what had been recorded with what. So Corey literally like matched all the tones, and we went and spent like weeks in his studio matching them, put them all into a Kemper, and everything's running through MIDI. So uh -huh. I don't touch anything. Well, I okay. used to have a backup like board on stage in case the MIDI went out that I could use with my foot, but the yeah. MIDI is so consistent. I've been doing it for eight years now, and we've never really had a problem. So now I don't have anything on stage at all because I'm literally running around. Like I can't be switching stuff or I have to stand in the same position and like the stage is moving around us. It's just not possible. So we have everything running through Kempers, but the tones are dude. I look, I'm, I'm an analog guy and I love amps and I love vintage stuff and all. I love it, but I have to say I'm unbelievably impressed with the Kemper. Um, yeah. And I it's also, a lot of it has to do with, Corey and I, uh, Corey more so, but us sitting together and matching the tones meticulously. If you put in the time, you can really get some unbelievable tones. Yeah, we we recently worked with Corey on what what you did. So, um, you know, yeah, one of the yeah. things we, we do with artists a lot is, um, you know, we do these evaluations. So I'll make prototypes of things and we'll send them to artists to evaluate. Uh, so I made six guitars and I sent them to Josh. I sent them to Corey. Um, we sent them to Jeff Schroeder and um, Fish Herring, right? Oh, cool. uh, and we sent, we sent them around to everybody and uh, you guys play them. We had like different neck shapes, body contours, all these things that we're trying to test. Um, and Corey like recorded all, you know, all he six played guitars. Them all and, and like played them back and forth and, and actually fish did that too, which was really cool. Um, and you know, this is like one of those things that like we work really closely a lot, uh, with, you know, with you guys, um, where we're just trying to always constantly get feedback on stuff. And, you know, that kind of relates to, you know, what we do with products. We're always trying to see what you like in your personal guitars and how we can like translate that into something you can buy 
um, in, you know, your local music store. So, you know, we got a question about, um, you know, some Pacifica single cuts and about tone woods and stuff. So, uh, Josh, you want to show some of your uh, custom guitars that we've done over the years? Yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah. yeah, let me grab the... Uh... All right. Yeah. All right. Let me let me get this plugged in so we can make some noise if we want. I've got my Yamaha THR. This is my my main practice amp. Oh yeah. I'm the, uh, the, my THR over here. I got it on the side. Dude, they're the best. I mean, it's I such a great practice practice guitar practice guitar amp. Like I it's wireless. Oh, it's nice. A, you got. I I snagged one. Dude, it looks awesome. I have the uh, what do you guys call it? The uh, the like dark sort of like anthracite black one. Yeah, yeah. So that was like the first THR 10C. Um, it was more like boutiquey, like Dumble yeah. style. Yeah, yeah. So it has some really cool models in there of some some really fun amps. Um, but definitely check out the the new THR. So the new THRs got um, all three. Like you know, previously we did like. The metal version, which was green, but the boutique one that was blue, and the classic one that was like that off white. This one, we kind of packed them all into one. And it's even got Bluetooth, so you can like stream music from your phone, and it's got the wireless Dude, capability. Use I can't wait. They're they're sending me one right now. I talked to Scott, so I can't oh, yeah. I can't wait to uh, to check it out. I I seriously, this Yamaha THR, like, so we're yeah, playing buddy. this right here. Um, let me try to lower the camera a bit. By the way, I'm not like a Ted Bundy guy. The, the reason there's nothing behind me on the wall is I'm redoing my studio. So I'm not some sort of weird serial killer. Um, it looks <laughs> I got very... nothing on my wall either. It, well, you know, don't worry. Yeah, you it, got it's... a mirror. You have an excuse. Yeah, but you know what? what's going to happen is this is a, a spare bedroom, and I'm going to redo my whole garage and turn it into like a real workshop. And this is going to be a, an actual bedroom for like when my folks or my sister come visit. So oh, nice. I want to start blowing holes in the wall, hanging guitars, because that's not what everybody's going to want to look at when they come stay no, over with I'm, us. I'm, I'm sort of completely redoing my home studio. I, I've been getting like rugs and lighting and stuff. And, and I took everything down from the wall. So just so everybody knows, I, you know, it's going to look yeah, sick in a couple of weeks. Okay. Um, yeah. But this is, this is my white Pacifica that you made me. I absolutely love this guitar. This 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 guitar probably gets the most playing in the Shania show because all the country stuff, for the most part, yeah. is played on this guitar. Not all of it because I have other sort of like T style Pacificas that get played, but this. <laughs> So yeah. cool. Doing those behind the string bends or behind the nut bend there. Yeah, uh, I'm yeah. So, there, but I promise so I'll do so it better next time. Speaking of uh, the tone wood, you know, um, one of the questions was like, what what is our favorite tone wood? You know, this guitar, it's you know roughly based on you know that Pacifica single cut style. So it's an ash body, um, and then we made a custom maple neck. It's a one piece neck that we what we do is like we take the board. Um, and we slice the fingerboard off and then we put the truss rod in and glue, glue it all back together. Um, and this is actually the second neck that we made for you because the first one we made, um, you know, you had requested just like super jumbo frets. Yeah, this was uh, a long time ago. I, I made a big, I made a big choice and uh, wasn't the best choice, but well, you know, you make you mistakes know, to a certain extent in life. So. <laughs> no, I don't think it's a mistake at all because you played it for plenty of years and, and it's, yeah. it worked at the time, but then, you know, it, things changed. You had to play more slides, so you wanted, like, some smaller fret wire, um, and that's yeah. normal. Man. That's just yeah. going to be, you know, that's what it is. So um, we made this neck. 
Um, and this is just like your classic combo uh, for, you know, a real awesome country style guitar. Um, yeah. We put those Lawler 52, t- uh, you know, T pickups in there. Um, I think these are the standard. I think these are the Lawler just Tele specials, I think. Oh, is that the special in that one? I think yeah, it's just think the standard. We- I, yeah, I think it's the standard because I think the uh, the 52 uh, Lawler had, remember, it was too thin. Yeah, we tried that. We cool. tried that on the other one. It was really bright. It might be cool for certain things, but visually, when I told you about this guitar, I kind of referenced Jeff Beck's Esquire that yeah. he had played way back in the day, and the sort of the the aging that had been done on. And I also don't like any lacquer on the back of the neck, so you just shaved it to look. I, I've always said, like, when I want a guitar that's sort of in the like T style world like this, I just want it to feel and look like a hunk of wood. I want it yeah. to look like you like tore off a piece of barn wood and now it's my guitar that's what i like and and that's exactly like it just feels like you like this guitar gets dropped in the road and who cares it just like gets beat up and it just feels better and i I just love it It, and it it just all the standard like telly kind of like you know uh Jeff Beck, you know, it's like Jeff is like one of my favorite players of all time. And I always wanted to emulate his like vibrato technique. And he was just so cool. I I took a course when I was in college, Jeff Beck, you know, guitar lab taught by this dude, Julian Casper, who's like really killing guitar player too. And oh, that's awesome. I just always loved, and, and I see that in your playing a lot, where it's like your intonation and, and kind of like the way that you approach some of the bends. Like I, I see and hear that influence a lot, which is so sick because you pull it off like perfectly. It's oh, it's very you. nuanced the way that you have to play like that. And for you to do it, it's just, it's so amazing. So I always love that. I have one of his, like one of those ox blood, you know, um, from what was it? The blow by blow uh record cover i've got that record framed and i'm gonna put that on my wall literally later this week i that record changed my life and that's a weird record because that's a mix of his esquire and the oxblood les paul yeah and it's sort and, of like transitional period yeah yeah for sure and, and dude i have all of his records on i got the vinyl you know i just Wired. went to the flea market Dude, so this is the one thing that I miss a lot is like every first Sunday of the month, they used to do the Pasadena flea market and it was just awesome to go get records and so see. that went away a little bit, but um, hopefully it comes back. Um, yeah. The Rose Bowl stuff too. But I, I, with Jeff, I never like learned Jeff Beck's licks because I think with Jeff, it's not about licks at all. He's not a lick guy. He's got a couple he falls back on, but like it's more about the phrasing. So all that like... <laughs> That that's the sort of yeah. Isn't the all that. incredible? I love that what the record with Rod Stewart, like just do both the, the record Truth with Jeff Beck group with Rod Stewart, and also Beckola is kick ass. But Truth is the record, like that Truth. one. Like what is it? Uh, All that just kit. I, I love when he brings in the rockabilly, like into yeah. like blue stuff. Where he'll be playing. It's just, I, oh, yeah. I, I love it so much. So, so when you made this guitar, I was like, dude, I'm Jeff Beck. And not literally, but like, I, I just, uh, he he always has meant a lot to me. And this was sort of my uh, attempt at an homage. And you, you, you created a guitar that I just love playing. Like this guitar gets as much playing as anything that I own. Anything. Well, that's this awesome. is kick ass. And then more recently, we made you one that we displayed at NAMM this last year um, in 2019. Or excuse me, 2020 before everything went down. You know, the NAM show is in January. Usually runs right through my birthday. 
Uh, so it's a it's a fun little birthday present to be able to show off some custom guitars, and um, you know this was one of them that we showed, and uh, it was in a little bit of a different guise at that time. We made a new neck for this guy too because of a little mishap on the road. Um, yeah, but check check this one out, folks. This is um, um, similarly based on that yes. previous LR, the white guitar. Sorry, all my cables are getting wrapped up over here. <laughs> no worries. Um, so, yeah, I mean, kind of tell the backstory on, on you know, the color and, you know, the style. And I'm sorry. Give me one second here. I've got all sorts of stuff. Um, cabling <laughs> just all wrapped up. Um, so this guitar was something that I had, I had really wanted made for a while. So once again, when I'm when I'm playing with Shania, I play a lot of sort of T-style guitars like like the you know the other guitar that we just uh ah sorry. <laughs> it's fine. Um but um it, it I I end up playing a lot of T-style guitars because I just find they're the most um applicable to all genres like it just applies. You could play rock, you can play country, you can play kind of anything. Mm -hmm. And I also am a really big fan of 1950s color palettes. Yeah. So this wasn't the first time I'd done this, but we we uh, utilized um, some of the color combination or the color codes of 50s General Motors, which would include like what Buick, Oldsmobile, Chevrolet, um, Cadillac. Yeah. Um, and we ended up finding. I sent you a photo that was taken in front of this place. It looks like it's in like Nice, France, but it's somewhere in the United States. Yeah, um, I don't think, yeah it looks like it's a, it could be Monaco, but it's cool, yeah. Yeah, and it was basically like this sort of like shell pink, but a little bit more muted than shell pink. Yes. And I, I, this, I, I have lighting in the studio right now. I think it's you're seeing a relatively good example of what it looks like. Hopefully in person you can really see it, but... Um, this guitar went through some changes. We had a road mishap where the, the neck got jacked up and you ended up making a new neck. Um, I actually do prefer the, the neck that you made this time. It's it's made of a different wood than we had last time. Um, and yeah. I, I really, really love this neck. And then in, in the uh, in the bridge, we originally had a 52 Tele Lawler. Yeah. And I'm sure that would work great for a very specific style, but it was just there was no bass. And it was yeah. very... Um, it had a lot of high end and it was just a little shrill. So we threw in a regular uh, Lawler special, right? Yeah, we, we put the, the, um, the special in there. Now, th this guitar is a, a little unique. So, you know, I, I'm not going to say that it's, you know, Lawler, you know, it's we we chose that pickup thinking, you know, um, we would go down this road. You wanted to give it a shot. But, you know, that pickup is made to sound very specifically like an old school exactly. 52, very bright, but also it's exacerbated by the fact that this is a left-handed bridge on this guitar. Yes. So it's, it's a, it, the, the, you know, pickup is typically skewed. So the, the bass side is a little closer to the neck and the treble side is a little closer to the bridge. Well, we swapped it on this guitar. Yep. And the reason why I like doing that, especially on this specific guitar, um, there, there's two reasons. One is sonically. Um, I always like to have a little bit tighter bass and a little bit sweeter treble because a lot of the time on a, like a T-style guitar, that treble is very ice picky. It's like really super sharp. Yeah. And it could be a little bit much. Um, and, you know, if you were to switch it, what happens is those, you know, the, the magnets are a little bit further up the road towards the neck on that treble side. So you're going to get a little bit sweeter sound. It changes the harmonic position that it's sitting in. And then that bass side, it's going to be a little bit closer to the, the saddle. So it's a little tighter, a little bit, you know, more like if you had a humbucker real close to a bridge kind of thing. Totally. So, and and yeah. I, yeah, you're right. I want to make it very clear. I'm not talking any ish on Lawler. I love Lawler and I have their, I have Lawler pickups in basically everything I've got. I've got some really great Seymour Duncan custom shop stuff that MJ yeah. and more have made me but um yeah it was a choice that that i thought would work uh, upon not hearing it when you pick up a, a pickup that you've never heard and you just are basing it off of like a 52 telly oh that sounds great it, it just wasn't right for what i do like you said but sure. this pickup, 
it's a bright guitar, you know, it's an ash body again, and you know, it's a maple neck, rosewood fingerboard, stainless frets, you know, it's got a lot of trouble in it. So, you know, just naturally. Um, so we decided like, okay, let's go for the fatter pickup because the guitar is naturally brighter. We want the special and it seems like it's worked out great. It's, it's perfect now. It's really perfect and it, and it fits better because this uh, neck pickup also made by Lawler, the, the mini broiler, the Rickenbacker yeah. mini broiler, um, has a little bit more um, than a typical T-style neck pickup, a little bit more bass and stuff. So this this new Tele, uh, Tele Special by Lawler, they, they match really well. So here, let me let me give you guys a little bit. And also we have a Rudders, which is a funny story we can talk about. Rudders, who builds these incredible 1950-style Fender parts that are like to a T exactly what Fender made, was a family friend of mine and somebody that my dad worked with and I used to yeah. test initial guitars when I was 15, 16 years old. I'd only been playing for like two years and I would test his guitars when he was literally, they were in prototype mode. Like he had not made anything for anybody yet. And yeah. he was literally running a CNC machine company at that time. Yeah. He does some really good machining. Yeah. It's, it's great. Those knobs are cool. They got a really nice grip neural to them. They're, it's like heavy duty stuff. So yeah, we used like that bridge and I requested the left-handed bridge. And you know, the second reason we use that is because if you look at the guitar, the pick guard and the and the bridge pickup kind of follow this line. So it's like a nice little designed part. It matches that kind of BB yeah. red starish pick guard. So it makes the guitar look a little bit more like it's part of that Yamaha family. And it, it was really fun. And you know, we age the finish like we do on a lot of your guitars. But yeah, let's let's give it a little sound test. Here. Sorry, got all these once again cabling stuff. Yeah, Killer. there we go. Doesn't get better than that, man. Man, it's so fun. I, I love this guitar. It's it's um it's a little bit less um bright and telly-ish than the previous guitar that we had just played, but I like that because this one this one can work. I think this one maybe works a little bit more for um straight up like kind of classic rock. And on honestly, um these guitars work really well in a pairing on a recording where like mm. one guitar is to the left, one guitar is to the right. Because they have just enough variation where they still sound like they're in the same world. But I can basically keep all the amp settings the same and just go back and forth. And yeah, that's yeah. something I've done. And it really, for that kind of like Joe Walshy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that broiler too, man. That, that mini broiler yeah. is... So cool. That's like one of the best things Lawler's come out with. I mean, and we've put in your guitars, we put the the Charlie Christian for like humbucker size in one of the, the smaller hollow bodies, um, the SA yeah. 1500. We put in like Imperial High Wines and two of like uh, one is in the green SA 2200. Yeah, let me play for just a second with the mini broiler because oh, I didn't yeah. actually have that on. It's just, it's just awesome. It sounds great. Yeah, here, let me oh, show yeah. off a couple more of those. I wish my, uh, 
my in ears were a little <laughs> bit had a little bit longer rope to them. Let me. Uh, oh, no worries. Man. So yeah, I mean we we've done so many guitars o- over the years. We'll have to do another episode of this to show off some more of them. But I mean we did. Yeah, this green SA twenty two hundred is pretty rad. Um, and this one's uh, pretty fun because. It just started out as a stock guitar, and then we refinished it in this kind of green nitro. Same kind of thing. You send us a picture. You're like, I'm really looking for this, you know, this certain look. I'm looking for this certain shade. And then we just mix it up, man, and that's it. So Totally. Um, I, I missed a little bit of what you said just due to the fact that my in-ears weren't in, but I I, I think you're talking about the, the uh, color of this guitar, right? Yeah, this yeah. This is like Cadillac green. I. Like I said before, I love 1950s General Motors colors, and you yeah. guys have been awesome. Like this guitar was initially like a sunburst, but it was very sort of like moderny looking with a lot of lacquer on it. Sure. And we talked about this. I, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I just don't like it personally. I like a more of like a matte sort of nitro finish, and um, this guitar just worked out perfectly for that. And you guys, this this guitar I've been using a ton. I I actually use this quite a bit on that new Derek Frank solo record. And this guitar is just, I mean, I I feel like basically I can pretend to be like Eric Clapton in cream when I actually put this, this guitar in, man, this cabling thing is driving me insane. All right. Let me, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, here, let's, uh, Sorry, I, this uh, this setup for the playing was something I threw together right before, so the cabling's not all the right lengths. But um, no like, here's that sort of, like Clapton, like bridge pickup uh, with the um, bridge pickup with the tone rolled off, the woman tone. And Josh is one of those guys that uses his tone knob. That's right. In tune before that, but it gives oh, yeah. uh, it's got that great, just awesome. And the neck pickup sounds killer on it. Um, Yeah, yeah, man. man. Oh, yeah. Well, um, speaking of hollow body, you also um, play with with uh, Molly, right? I play with Molly Miller. This. She's uh, I work with her a bunch. She's uh, I guess technically my boss at uh, Los <laughs> Angeles. Music. She's the uh, head of the guitar department. Molly's awesome. She's she's absolutely kick ass. She plays with Jason Mraz and does a lot of really cool gigs with um, a lot of amazing folks around town. She plays. Uh, almost exclusively sort of a style like, you know, a, a lot more jazz style tone wise, but plays a semi hollow body. And that's yeah, sort of yeah. her like, thing. And, yeah. I uh, want to make sure we, we, you know, talked about that because you've been teaching there and stuff too, you know, that's been another huge thing. And I just, I'm so impressed by like all these crazy things that you've done throughout your life. You know, it's just always been awesome. And man, hearing you play through all these guitars, Makes me miss you, man. I, I we got to get together. Um, I, absolutely, man. I, I I miss hanging out and, and talking guitars and talking music. And and um, I'm glad we're here doing it now, though. I mean this this is so fun to actually get a chance to. I mean I I love getting a chance to show off these guitars because I mean to me this is just like you can see the ring light I've got back there. But um, hopefully you can really sort of see it's just. The, the look of these guitars is incredible, and I have so many guitar players walk up to me and be like, "Dude, what is that?" Yeah. What is that? Like, what's that? What's that guitar? Who makes that? What's that? You know, what's that paint job? What's the, you know, where did you go to get that done? Is it, is, did it come that way? And it's like, I'm so lucky. And I get to tell everybody like, oh yeah, one of my really, really good buddies, Pat Campolitano is 
the head of the custom shop at Yamaha guitars and like builds all this stuff for like dudes in the smashing pumpkins and like Nathan East and Billy Sheehan. And he also makes my guitars, which is crazy, but um, it's really awesome to be able to go to lunch with you and sit down and us talk about what exactly I'm looking for. And you know, all the references I've got. So when we talk about Jeff Beck and yeah. Brent Mason and folks like that, like, you know, exactly where I'm coming from. So it, it really makes it easy having you there because as a sounding board, I, I know exactly when you're understanding and I'm making myself clear enough that it's, that it makes sense to you. I know if you get it, then they're like, okay, I did enough of a job of explaining what I'm looking for. Um, well, you know, the other thing too is like, we have fun experimenting with different stuff. Like we're not afraid to like kind of try something a little different, a little more unique, a little more, you know, out there. And it's been fun. I just like, you know, we tried different pickups and Hey, you know, let's try a, a different one or like, you know, Hey, I set this up for slide, but I'm actually going to play a different way because after I got the guitar and I heard it, I realized, Hey, I actually like the sound for rock, you know, or whatever. It yeah. Is. So, well, I, they're, they're, speaking of, I want to show off that guitar with the Charlie Christian pickups. Cause unfortunately yeah, I yeah. broke a flat wound string because I can't stop bending sometimes, even though I've got flat wound. So I broke the string, but um, oh, let me show you that guitar. Cause that's an incredible, it's like a sort of a smaller body semi hollow that we put uh, Charlie Christian pickups in and then flat wounds on. But weirdly that's enough, it actually sounds amazing for like rock rhythm tracks. It's oh, very cool. cool for like sort of like low to medium gain, like just like big fat here. Let me grab that guitar. Yeah. And, and guys, these are stock guitars. You know, a lot of these are stock guitars. So some of them I've made completely from scratch, but a bunch of them are actually just stock guitars. So, like this SA2200, it's made in Japan, um, but that's a guitar that you can buy and do some of these mods yourself. Like if you want to change the tuners or you want to change the pickups or something like that, and really gets you, you know, like 99% of the way there as to what Josh has. So this guitar that he's holding that he's picking up is a SA1500, which is a smaller body, hollow body guitar. Um, and we just did, uh, we did a couple of things. So the first time we changed a pickup, we put the lot of gold foils in it and I made some wacky rings. And then the next time we went and we put, I forget what, what else we put in there. Um, some other foil type pickup. And then this time we put the Charlie's in there. Those are the Lawler Charlie Christian for humbucker size. And when you said you want to put flats on it, I was just like, Oh, this is wild. So, okay. Like, I, you know, I got to hear it. And it turned out awesome because Charlie's are like one of my favorite pickups, the Charlie's and the gold foils. And now those broiler pickups have been so rad. Um, so, you know, Josh had just been telling him about the history of this guitar, but yeah, yeah, play a little bit for us and show us like what you love about it. Yeah. Let me show you. I've got five strings. Keep that in mind. But um, let me, uh... <laughs> Hey, it was good enough for Keith, right? That's right, except I'm missing the high string. But uh, it's all right. It's sort of classic rock. Once again, you know what? Let me unplug these ears. This, hopefully this works out, but this uh, I'm going to have some sort of a conniption fit if I keep getting these. The in-ear monitors sound fantastic, but I got this like punk-ass cable that's like way too short. So I got I to gotta get an extender for that. Let me tune this up for you. So yeah, this was a really fun project, and you know, because Josh has got to play so many different tunings and settings and things like that, this is just another one of those guitars that's in the arsenal, and um, it's got a really unique sound. I'm a big fan of hollow bodies too, and I consider it to be kind of like one of the specialty things that I build. Um, you know, I've done some for Scott Holiday, Dave Cooning, Killers, and for Josh and, and Butch Walker and stuff too. So it's it's really fun for me. Um, some have built from scratch, some have been, you know, restored, but yeah, go ahead.
It's just got, it's got such a, it's got such a cool tone to it. And, uh, and, and the flat ones really hold together those chords. So when I'm playing these sort of like, I can get all these sort of extensions in there. It's just yeah. fantastic, man. The, yeah, the, the really unique thing about those Charlie pickups is, you know, it's it's got the blade pull piece, right? But it's it's almost like half a P90, and but it's a single coil pickup, right? But the unique part is it's got thicker wire, like much thicker wire than a normal pickup has. So like any single coil or humbucker pickup that you've used, it uses really, really thin wire, like 42 gauge, 43 gauge. It's, it's very, very skinny. Whereas this uses like a 37, 38, 39, something like that. So it's, it's a much fatter wire. Um, so the resistance is really low. If you put like a voltmeter on it, you'd measure like, I don't know, something like three, four K, um, you know, resistance, the ohm output. Um, but if you listen to it, it's loud. It's a loud pickup yeah. because it's got, it's got two magnets on the base, right? So it's got a lot of power um, and it's got a lot of bass. It's got a lot of low end. Um, but because I think that, that um, wire, it's got like this certain amount of clarity. And the cool part is like, you know, how they scatter wine and everything. It gives it this really like complex sound that even when you have a lot of low end, sounds really clear um, and can hold up to like cording and stuff and, you know, playing from. Uh, you know, some of those those really like heavy, like you said, rock guitar, like you'll play a, a lick or a riff or something like that, or, or a couple of chords, a few notes, they all bloom together. They all have like a nice Absolutely. ring out to them. Uh, well, that's why I really like that. It's not for everyone, but it's no. very cool if you could, you know, it's like I, if you like it. I wouldn't want it to be like if I had one guitar, I probably wouldn't pick Flat Wounds and Charlie Christians. But I mean, the thing that people have to remember is like, round wound strings like even the early beatles records were played on flat wounds like oh, yeah. until what like roughly the mid 60s there weren't really a lot of round wound guitar strings that sort of there started like, in companies yeah yeah it was like you know like some of the early like clapton stuff in like 64 is sort of like the birth of a lot of that round wound sound so a lot of that sort of classic rock and roll stuff that <laughs> That is very much that like early 60s, late 50s. And you can, the cool thing is that the flat wound sort of counterbalance the potential brightness of it. So, yeah. so you can get all this cool picking back by the bridge stuff without it getting too like. Let me make sure. Yeah. One more thing. But um, yeah, I it I absolutely love it. It's like I said, it's not for everything, but when it works, it's the perfect choice. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it, the cool part too is like it does have that very vintagey sound where it sounds almost like like you said, like the Beatles kind of thing where they plug into the board. Like so, yeah, you could probably use like one of those JHS like color, uh, what do they call it, crayon or the color box or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and if you use this pickup in like those flat wound strings, you can get a lot of that really cool '60s kind of distortion where it's like a, li a little ratty, but it's like it's fun. It's it's cool, man. I, I you know, there's you so many unique sounds for guitars. Yeah, I mean, you can get a mix of sort of that '50s thing, but you can also get some of the like rattier garage rock, like black keys, like broken amplifier type sound too, because. Yeah. It just the way it it's it's really hard to explain until you actually I think a lot of rock guitar players and a lot of modern guitar players have never played a guitar with flat wounds. Um, no, not not often because it's like m most people like you know 
just they go to the guitar store and they're like, yeah, I'm, I'll try a different brand, but they don't really think like go flat because I mean, there's other stuff too. You can go flat rounds, half rounds. I mean, yeah. there are so many things to change your sound. So there's so many things. And, and a lot of times it's the things that you don't think of, like the speaker in your amp cabinet, like that Huge. is your thing that, that, you know, I collect old bases and like weird. In fact, a lot of the old crazy, like knockoff Japanese, like Tysco stuff. And I've got, a couple with flats on it. I've got got one with half wounds on it. I've got some with regular round wounds. Like I've got the whole shebang for bass playing stuff. And for guitar, I try to do the same thing. I've got a guitar in Nashville tuning, like yeah. one of the standard Pacificas over here in sort of a seafoam green that you set up in a Nashville tuning. And like, it's not always applicable, but when it's the right thing, it's the perfect thing. And it yeah. really like changes the track. So you know, I love mixing up things like that because sometimes all you need is like the, the nice thing about the almost dead nature of round wounds or sorry, flat wounds is like you can get these sort of like. It's like the flappiness and like. Yeah. And, and it works well with effects. Like if I, if I really sort of like push up that spring reverb and get some real like. it's a vibe and it doesn't sound like oh it's like butt rock you know what i mean like it never mm -hmm. has that vibe because flat ones don't have that association and you can it, it just has this different so if i was recording like some weird cool garage rock lo-fi record this would be like one of the first even though this guitar is like beautiful and it doesn't come across as lo-fi at all sure you get that vibe from it because of the way that the flat wounds mix with the charlie yeah. Christian pickups you know yeah for sure i mean it's it's relatively inexpensive thing to try and it's fun they last a long time you could take them off and put them back on if you wanted to like it, it's fun just go get a set of diario chromies and give it a shot it's it's yeah. awesome and i mean speaking of vibes man like you've got the greatest vibe this has been awesome and you know i i love you sharing all this stuff um thanks for like supporting us so much congrats on the bill and ted movie thank you it's man excellent uh and <laughs> um yeah man i i hope we get to to hang soon i mean luckily we're in the same hood somewhat so um maybe we'll have a have a beer in the backyard or something like that but um yeah i mean if people want to catch up with you or they want to see what you're up to where could they find you um, I would say my Instagram is going to be the home of everything. Like if I have anything externally outside of Instagram, it'll be linked to on my Instagram. Um, and that's just Joshua Ray Gooch, J O S H U A R A Y G O O C H on Instagram. And, um, I'm coming out with a podcast that's, that's coming out in the next couple of weeks. I've recorded four episodes. Uh, the graphic mm -hmm. design's getting done. I'm sort of banking them before I start releasing them, but yeah. um, I don't want to release the name yet because I'm still sort of securing um, some of the uh, uh, URL and all that good stuff. But um, yeah, people people can absolutely go check that out. I'll give that information out. It's going to co be coming out the first episode in the next couple weeks on my on my social media Instagram page. Um, and yeah, Instagram's going to have everything. I'll link to any like articles about the Bill and Ted stuff that's coming out. Uh, that Derek Frank record I recorded with Jim Scott, the legendary Jim Scott. And like, you know, the drummer on that record's Randy Cook, who's like, he yeah. did he as Ringo Starr's drummer. Like, that's all you really need. To <laughs> yeah, uh, for sure. And are you still doing the lesson stuff too? You doing privates and all that? I do. I do private lessons. Um, I've got a couple slots open because I've had a couple students just due to the fact that they they lost their job. They don't have funds yeah. for let. So yeah, if anybody's looking for private lessons, they can hit me up on my Instagram page. Just send me a DM. Um, dude, I'm all from the king, dude. So I, I appreciate it. I, I'm also teaching um, uh, lessons at uh, Los Angeles College of Music for my friend and our friend Molly Miller, who's the head of the guitar department. Um, they Still have one guitar. So yeah, she's, you, she's, trust she's me, she's not, gonna, she's not gonna say no. I I promise. Oh, no, I know. Well, we, you know, when things calm down, we got to bring her into the shop and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, um, wh what else were you saying there? I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, 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 it's all good. I, 
I love teaching at that school. Um, there's so many great people. I mean, some of the other teachers there have played with people like Frank Zappa and Ray Charles. And like, it, it's just, it, it's just awesome. It's a great school. I love teaching there. Um, and like I said, I do privates and, and uh, I'm working on some more music for some upcoming movie and TV stuff. So I'm trying to keep busy. I mean, work isn't like it used to be just due to the fact that like there's less stuff happening, but I'm, I've been very lucky that like I've been able to keep working. I have a lot of great people around me. I work with, um, and I just want to say thank you to Yamaha, uh, for a decade of support. I mean, I really can't express, I've said this a million times, but it really never, to me, never ceases to be an important aspect of my life. Yamaha has supported me from when I was 18 years old. Nobody had ever heard of me. And I was going on this massive tour that I was essentially completely like, had no idea what to expect. And Yamaha was there supporting me every second of the way, helping me out with guitars. And I was like, hey, they want me to play a hollow body. I don't have one. Can you guys help me out? Every step of the way, Yamaha has been great. And then Pat, you specifically like, you, you don't know how helpful it is to know that no matter what happens with these gigs and these whatever, all these different things that I'm doing, to know that I have somebody like yourself as a sounding board, somebody to ask questions to, to inquire about knowledge um, that I don't have and that I want to learn. And that all of my guitar is like, it's amazing to have these new guitars that I feel comfortable bringing into a room with somebody that's like, oh yeah, here's my you know early 70s fender strat and it's like this kick-ass guitar and i'm like cool check this out this is my yamaha and like we can be on this like somebody can bring out a twenty-five thousand dollar vintage guitar and i feel completely comfortable busting out my yamahas and playing right on right alongside of them knowing that my tone is going to be at the same level if not better and that that means a whole lot and a lot of that's due to the fact that um you've built me so many amazing custom guitars and then with stock guitars that have been made in the custom shop um but for production out of Japan, you know, you've made the guitars customized in a perfect way that makes it feel like it's my guitar specifically um, without us having to do these crazy surgeries like this guitar and the uh, SA2200 that we talked about before. There's, there's a bunch of other ones too that we didn't get to today. But yeah, um, we'll, we'll have to do this again. We'll, we'll have to do, I mean, thank you so much for, you know, it, it's just been great like being buddies this whole time. Really, I, I feel like, it's not work because it's really, it is like a family. Yamaha has been awesome to you, but they've been awesome to me too. And it's yeah. been great. I mean, I, I really can't say like how much you can't take it for granted, especially in a time like this, like, you know, how supportive they've been and like how much they've helped me and my family and it's just everything. So it's just like, Thanks so much, and thanks for supporting us and and representing the company in such a great way. Um, and oh, it really is a family. Yeah. You know? Like we call each other up. We say, you know, the like yeah. not related to guitars. We go get dinner. We go get lunch. We just hang out. We say what's up. Like there's so much beyond just the nuts and bolts of what the instrument is. It's really like a relationship where it's like we're trying to grow together and it, yeah. it's like a sounding like you said i'm a sounding board for you but that's what you are for us so it's just like it's constantly like this back and forth thing and it, it is a really personal thing i know the a company can be so large and it seems like a monolith um but really when you see the people that we work with every day it doesn't um, feel like a monolith at all which is yeah, amazing it's, it's, it's much smaller that they and have. If you guys watch the the open house online, you saw it. it's three of us in there, and before yeah. it was three, it was just me. <laughs> it was just one, you know. Well, so it's like um, I think it, one last connection that you and I have is that you got hired as this pre prestigious position at what twenty six, twenty five, yeah, five. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and I had a very similar trajectory in that sense, where we were in this job that we worked really hard to get, and in some ways, we're absolutely absolutely qualified for but at the same time coming from a place of like being way younger than everybody else and really having to like step up and let people know that like hey this isn't a hobby for me this is like this is my life and so i think that was a connection that you and i had i mean we both were hired into positions way younger than almost anybody gets hired into them and i think that sort of a connection between us it was like an understanding of like hey when you're the young guy you have to kick ass or else you're going to get smacked around and people are going to really flip you a lot of shit. So yeah. 
I think you and I really, uh, that was another connection that I think, you know, really helped us, helped us out in this uh, uh, friendship relationship or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I mean, you got to learn how to swim like immediately. So, yeah. it, 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 but the cool part is that even if I did ever make a mistake or, you know, and I, I'm not a perfect person, I have made mistakes. So it's just like, they've been cool throughout the whole thing. And that's just like amazing. And, you know, all, all the artists that I've worked with have been just nothing but friendly and, and you're one of the best. And I, you know, I don't say that lightly. So thank you for joining me today. Thank you, thank you for all the support. Well, let's do this again. You know, when your podcast launch, we'll talk about more guitars. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I would love to, you know, do more because, you know, we have, you know, chatted so long and, um, you know, we do have this awesome backstory. There's, there's more stories than, there's than a lot more. This is the beginning. I, I want to say thank you again to you and thank you to Yamaha and let's do this again. There's a lot more uh, stuff to cover. All right, everybody stay happy, stay healthy. Check out Josh on his Instagram and for yeah. Yamaha, thank you so much. Check out the next on the bench. Cheers.